the majority of the population feel like they don't have the digital skills to be successful. And we're not going back to the classroom. So this learning is going to happen in a virtual environment. Welcome to the second renaissance where we decode the rebirth of human creativity in a technology driven world. In this second season, we explore how sustainability is elevating our human consciousness and catalyzing us to create within constraints. We decipher why now is the biggest entrepreneurial opportunity since the dawn of industrialization and what leaders can do to harness these winds of change. I'm Anders Sorman Nilsson, global futurist, impact champion and father and your host for the second renaissance. Anders, welcome to the podcast. Amazing to physically be across the desk from you. I know, we can nearly reach out. Don't touch 1.5. Okay. All right, there you go. How are you? <laughs> yeah, I'm good. Good to see you in the flesh. I think it's the flesh anyway. It is. In yeah. your studio. I feel a little bit like I've turned up to do my podcast in your house. It's sort of like going to someone's house for dinner and going, can you cook me some dinner? And uh, I like steak and a nice red wine. Yeah, this is our home turf, so please behave. Mate, mm. it is a phenomenal setup. For people listening on an audio there might be some video that we can share with everyone afterwards, but we've got tech going on on a desk here behind us over in the corner. Why don't you explain to everyone what you've got going on in your studio and why did you do it? I think we need like Matterport to do like a 3D animation of, of, uh, of this place to just, you know, really do it justice. But um, lockdown happened, pandemic happened. I realized, you know, technology was really our only lifeline. And as a, as a futurist, you know, what we share in terms of content around the world is really what drives our business. So we've doubled down on this uh, physical space. So I thought, you know, there's lots of great tech, you know, there's the roadcasters that we're speaking into or the pod mics from roadcaster, great little Aussie brand, you know, there's I think three different Sony 4k cameras that are capturing, you know, I think we both look better by the way, in virtual reality than <laughs> in do. real reality, <laughs> yeah. uh, IRL. So, um, so we've got that happening, lots of professional lighting. We've got some acoustic curtains here as well. But I think what I love about the studio and what makes me not miss international travel so much is that we've really doubled down on the sort of Swedish, Scandinavian decor. We've got some beautiful custom-built wooden uh, Tasmanian oak uh, just to be less Swedish, more Aussie, uh, Tasmanian oak bar tables that we're sitting at at the moment and uh, some other custom-built pieces that we use for our virtual conferencing. Um, and we've had great design help as well from uh, composition by Studio Elias, who are our neighbours downstairs, uh, who are interior designers, and they've helped kit out this place with beautiful you know, Danish lighting and all the rest. It's so. an amazing space because you walk in and a lot of what you talk about is this digital meets physical. You talk about, what, are you, what is it? The digital minds and the analog hearts? Am I? Yes. Or did I get around the right, that's the right, and, right way? And the rocket science word of digilog. Yes. Digilog. <laughs> and so a lot of that, you talk a lot about that and you walk into your studio space and you get that feel. You have this beautiful design, physical world meets high tech digital world. Why Why is that so important? Well, I think it's important for futurists who also, and as a futurist, I guess I am a little bit of a traditionalist and a, and a humanist at heart. You know, I'm still wearing a little pocket square today uh, here in the office. It was <laughs> not nice to actually put on a jacket today. So true story before you go on with that. That yes. little, uh, what do you call it in your pocket? Little pocket square. I, I know you square. even maybe yeah. at a Barcelona conference, maybe you even shoved the... I did put a sock in my jacket yeah, because I was so, it. not intimidated, but I was so impressed by your the presence, how you were dressed. And I felt very underdressed, underdressed as a tech exec with a t-shirt. I managed to borrow a jacket. I grabbed one of my socks and put my sock in there and then proceeded to present on stage. And I hope you weren't offended, but you actually found it um, flattering. Yeah. You put a sock in it, so yeah. you know, literally and metaphorically. No, it was uh, it was fantastic, and I think testament to your own, you know, your own persona and your own digital evangelista sort of character. So it's beautifully on 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 brand. Silly but to, humor. But yeah. to come back to that question, I mean, tradition and tech, right? Um, I think that's what makes it, you know, more relatable, and I think also a sense that you know we all have these new tools of production. You know, conferences were something that we used to travel to. They were, you know, a physical event, maybe on the other side of the world, or maybe it was the national conference that we used to travel to. Oftentimes in quite staid sort of, you know, conference settings or even hotels. 
And I think now, you know, people have gone to use, have gotten used to the idea that, you know, dogs and kids will walk into a Zoom call and, you know, on some level that's like really personable and people got to know each other a little bit more deeply, oddly, Mm -hmm. through the virtual interface throughout the pandemic. But then I think we're also now at a stage of, I think, technological maturity where we also have to double down and realize that we actually have these production tools at our disposal that we should use to actually have TV style, Netflix style productions at, you know, from our studios or even, you know, in a spare bedroom or whatever it happens to be. I guess that's a really good point because I I started out in digital. I wanted to be a musician. So I... You still want to be a musician. I I know. know, I'm working on it very, very slowly. But, um, But wanting to be a musician, you know, 10 years ago, traditionally you'd have to go to a studio, they'd get these big desks, you'd have all this technology that would cost a fortune, you'd have to buy the engineer for the day, the producer, and it would cost tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars to create an album. Then all of a sudden GarageBand came out and it became very easy. Maybe with the production that we have available to us with things like Zoom and with the different technologies from people like Rode, really anyone has the ability to be able to get their message across in a way that looks like a TV studio. And I think what's really important about that is that it levels the playing field and I only recently had a conversation with, with some execs at Salesforce and they were saying the majority of the population of the workers feel like they don't have the digital skills to be successful. They don't feel like they have the skills to be successful. And I think that's going to come down to learning and we're not going back to the classroom. So this learning is going to happen in a virtual environment. So I'm coming full circle now back to a conference, back to learning. What are you seeing in terms of this physical world meeting a digital world? So I came out with a book nearly 10 years ago now called Digilog, How to Win the Digital Minds and the Analog Hearts of Tomorrow's Customers. But it can equally be talent, right? And it's about how we don't necessarily throw away the analog baby, the physical baby with the digital Mm -hmm. bathwater in our moves towards digital transformation. But we take the best of both of these two worlds. And I think the pandemic, given these sayings of, you know, 10 years worth of digital transformation has been compressed into, you know, two years. All of that is true, but it doesn't mean that we're going to live our lives in the metaverse fully, right? It doesn't mean that we're going to disconnect from the physical world. It just means now as the world is starting to open up that we're going to crave the best of the face-to-face or the best of the interface-to-interface. So I think all learning will be a hybrid or a digilog version, right? There'll be times that we can tune into, you know, a nano piece of learning to, um, you know, micro university course. Like last year uh, through the University of Cambridge, I did their digital certificate in circularity or circular strategies and uh, and sustainability. Really great course, six weeks, Um, pretty immersive, but all run virtually. And yes, I think some of the learning experiences left some things to be desired, but it just showed you that the way we consume now and keep re-educating ourselves as needed are evolving. So I think there's a hunger to just consume content in new ways. And just as late as last week, we were doing some consulting work for News Corp where one of my key messages to them was that content is really just chemistry wrapped in narrative or content is chemistry wrapped in story. And so if we become really good storytellers, in a digitally democratized world where you've got, you know, the likes of Substack, et cetera, giving people a platform, journalists a platform to produce and publish new works, all of a sudden, you know, old school media don't have a monopoly on information anymore and, and people are publishing, whether it be a podcast like yours or, you know, on a Substack newsletter, for example. And I think all of those ways in which we consume content and learn are critical for organizations to get their heads around when it comes to L&D as well. Yeah, because storytelling, going back to the analog world, storytelling goes back to as far as when we apparently sat around the fire and we tell stories with each other. And too often you would see in so many different forums, whether it was digital or physical, just poor examples of communication. What's the key? What's the key to your storytelling? Because I'm someone who's passionate about getting on a stage and telling stories that I probably shouldn't. And maybe I use humor to get my story across, but I always come back to some form of theme. What's your key when you get onto a stage that makes your presentation so compelling? Well, first of all, thank you very much for, for thinking that. I know you've... Oh, yeah. and actually, I'm going to interject. 
you got best keynote presenter in Australia through some forum. So, you, yeah. so you clearly you've got accolades as well. It's not just my opinion. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, no, it's a very nice industry recognition that was just awarded on Friday by the PSA, which is the Professional Speakers of Australia Network, which is part of a, a global organisation uh, of professional speakers. So, well, this nice little. Very, yeah, not something I had expected, but actually felt really, really nice. And I think yeah. one of the reasons it felt nice is that, you know, you know, as a futurist speaking and sharing ideas, doing strategy planning, etc., and doing that physically, oddly, ironically, as a futurist, you know, people would fly me everywhere. You guys flew me yep. at one stage to Barcelona. Then we started doing some virtual events as well together. Um and uh, so I spent a lot of my time on the road in physical reality. And it's been really nice to get a little bit of recognition as well that, you know, doubling down on the virtual interface here, and but also trying to make the production Netflix style or HBO style has been something that's um, been met with some some recognition. So, um, but I guess, you know, from a, from a storytelling perspective, um, I always think, and maybe I do this intuitively now, but I, I do tend to think that, you know, the best stories are the ones that sort of follow along uh, Joseph Campbell's notion of the hero's journey, mm-hmm. you know, whether it's, um, whether it's Harry Potter or, or, or Luke Skywalker or, uh, in my case, my storytelling around my mum's little menswear store in Stockholm, Sweden, suffering under the effects of digital disruption. These kind of personal stories of, of a hero, uh, you know, going out into the world and, you know, living an ordinary existence and then, you know, finding that the world has changed in front of them. And then, you know, there's a call to arms, then they meet a mentor. There's 12 very defined steps uh, of the hero's journey. And I think whether every story that we tell meets that exact format or something, that's something that's hardwired into our human mentality. And I think also brands, be it, you know, personal brands telling a story in an educational context or whether it's big corporate brands, I think the best ones are the ones that step in to be the mentor, not the hero. They are the ones who actually help their clients along on a journey and give some tools, give them, you know, the the metaphoric sword to, you know, fight, you know, the hero's demons and, and come back with some lessons and learnings. And I think those sort of thoughts come to mind when I design our narrative as well. There could be a lot of people listening now that are probably thinking, how do I deliver a better presentation? whether they're doing a presentation to their team, whether they're having to update the CEO, whether they're at the local golf club and they have to do an MC duty. You've presented on stages all over the world, both physically and virtually. Do you approach a physical presentation? Clearly, there is going to be a a difference between the physical and digital. But in terms of the message, how would you um, suggest people go about the different mediums and what advice could you give to, practical advice to give to someone? Would it be reading this book? Would it be looking at other keynote presenters? Would it be reading an audience? Like, what are your best tips? Oh, I think all of the above probably. Um, I guess for the, you know, to one of the questions that you're asking there is about, you know, the analog versus the digital presentation. Yeah. Um, we do find that... Um, just given people's uncertainties and you know bandwidth questions and all of those uh, tech questions that when we work with brands they almost expect an even tighter presentation digitally so um, we were working recently with uh, with Dyson here from from the studio for their global supplier summit and I think we did four rehearsals. Um, wow. And the keynote was a 14-minute keynote. Super tight. You know, I sent them over four or five different versions of the slides until we, you know, agreed and everything was message aligned. Yeah. But it was very, it's not, it wasn't rehearsed in a bad way. It was just very polished and to the point. Whereas I think the physical unless you're presenting a TED and it's an 18-minute presentation and it's also extremely rehearsed yeah. and well-timed. I think the physical world actually allows some of the perfect imperfections to come through a little bit better yep. than, than the in the virtual because yeah, there's nothing more awkward. Like you've produced these shows, right? There's nothing more awkward than a presenter who's not attuned to the technology having you know tech issues or you know um, 
some technology fails throughout. So I do approach them slightly different where I think there's a little bit more leniency and a little bit more acceptance that some sometimes the you know the real gig in a studio or in a um you know in my equivalent to to your you know garage gigs for example in a conference that you know you can have a little stumble and you kind of make light of it whereas that's sometimes a bit more challenging in a studio context are you doing a lot of live versus on demand or is it all on demand i have a theory like i love live because I like the imperfections and I like the engagement and I like to chat to people and I like people to know it's real and it's happening in that moment because otherwise I feel like anything that's too overproduced, they can just go to YouTube or watch any of your previous episodes or presentations or whatever. Are you seeing that trend change? or And this has also got a lot to do, I believe, also with the the guts of the company, like can they tolerate, can they do a conference that's going to be like, you know what, we're going to go live and some companies just aren't ready to do anything like that. What's your take on it? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I think some companies probably have, it's not necessarily that they have a high risk tolerance. It's just like they haven't actually thought it through in terms of production and, you know, we've had some... uh, shocks and horrors in the middle of the night for example broadcasting to 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 the united states where one one big industry association we were working with you know their ea had signed up for their zoom account um, big industry conference by the way but you know the ea had signed up for the zoom account you know there was a maximum of 500 under that particular license she'd accidentally in this instance click the um click the box which said anybody can share their presentation and so they had 750 people logging on in the middle of my night, De- Des Moines, Iowa time. Um, and um, somebody else in the call, 750 on a 500 person license, somebody else started sharing their presentation in the middle of my keynote and it just like crashed the whole production. Yep. And then I sort of, pitch the idea that maybe they want to have something that was pre-recorded um you know you can call it simu live when you actually broadcast it um yep. with a bit of live q a to to bring that um feel into it and then of course then instead we, were, we had to do a post-production because you know the, the the live thing failed and um so i think that's not necessarily risk appetite i think that's just like poor preparation in that particular instance but there's a bit of a mixture now. I think 2021, um, a lot of organizations we're working with, like uh, Facebook and now Meta, you know, it's pre-produced, it's super sharp. Um, they might deliver it both in the physical world and in the virtual world. We're working with Align Tech, the, the dental tech company famous for Invisalign, for example. Mm-hmm. Again, really schmick productions, but we would always bring it back to a live Q&A at least to bring that live component to it. Um, but it is also, as you say, it's nice when you have some perfect imperfections, as long as, you know, things don't crash. Um, you know, I think I only had one instance when we were doing the event that perform at my previous company and they said, what happens if the power goes out? I go, well, don't be ridiculous. The power never goes out and I'm going live and the power goes out like literally 15 minutes before I'm about to go. And I went, it's okay, I know where the fuse is because we're having a house worked on. So someone had tripped the cable. But um, the other disadvantage we have in Australia is everyone does software updates when the US is peak and we're sort of, you know, offline. And so that makes it very difficult for us down here with internet speeds that aren't yeah. all We're not blessed with the world's <laughs> fastest internet here. And we are, we're filming this or we're recording this in Avalon, um, which is a beautiful beach suburb of sydney an hour's north so you live up here on a beautiful coastline it's pouring with rain outside it couldn't be a more atrocious day to be up here at the beach but very happy to be both physical and digital with you hey as you fly around the world what are you challenging what are you seeing out of companies at the moment how are the everyone's working from home people are talking about the great resignation people are needing to relearn what are the do you see any big themes as a futurist yeah, I think there's a few. Um, 
A is, you know, a constant question on, you know, what is the future of work? Is it, you know, is it remote? Is it hybrid? Is it two days in the office? Is it three days in the office? And I think it's all of the above. I think there's been a huge digital, in a sense, ironically, digital untethering or digital democratization where we've seen not just the great resignation, but also people very, very happy to have a tree change and a sea change and a lifestyle change and moving moving to the country um, to grow a lot of peaches and, uh, you know, all, all, all of that. Just my, my little m- musical, musical too, riff. Yeah. So, th- you know, that that trend, I think, will will continue for a little bit. But I also think that um, we're going to see a huge revival or what I call a, a second renaissance in our CBDs and our city centres as a result of, you know, corporate and commercial real estate, et cetera, shifting and changing. I think you'll see... You know, not necessarily just a flooding of big international brands, but as some of that physical infrastructure becomes available, you'll see more creatives eventually moving back and actually rejuvenating the cities. There's a huge push. Uh, you know, as a, as a futurist, I couldn't be a futurist without being extremely concerned about the climate and climate change yeah. and sustainability questions. And I think green now really is the new digital. So we've talked digital disruption, we've talked about digital transformation, but really the green transformation is the new digital. And I think what we're seeing across the board now, whether it's us working with, you know, Electrolux or with 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 Dyson, with with Microsoft, um, BMW, these are all companies who are just racing to boost their credentials, clean up their supply chains, build ecosystems where from food to table or from farm to table, from producer to consumer, through B Corp certifications, etc., cetera, uh, they're really getting their houses in order to drive a decarbonized future. And that's really heartening, I think. Um, some people were saying, during the pandemic hey clean is the new green you know we're gonna wear disposable masks that you know are once used once um single use plastics because we're so concerned about and we're all germophobes now we're also concerned Mm -hmm. about germs um yes we are but also you saw 34 percent of premium car owners across europe and the united states so these are owners of or co-financiers, whether finance companies of you know Tesla, uh, BMW, Audi, um, Land Rover, etc., being happy to switch brands if another automotive company had better sustainability credentials. We see nine out of ten Aussie consumers uh, happy happy to switch brands again based upon um, when it comes to food and grocery if they're more sustainable. 66% of consumers in Australia are happy to pay a premium for sustainable products. So there's this huge demand side switch to being happy to pay the true cost of something. And frequently that's also a more premium product. We're also seeing in the case of say Electrolux, what they're seeing is that consumers are shifting towards investing in a smarter home so yes we had the stay at home economy but now as the electricity grids are increasingly becoming powered by renewables people kind of going hey do we really want a methane gas Mm stove top do we want our house to be heated by methane or natural gas Mm -hmm. Uh, or should we go induction stove and yep. so they're switching the technologies, the big pieces of machinery in their homes, in their garages. People are making a whole scale, whole scale shift towards re- renewable um, technologies. And so that is something with 2030 targets that I think is a huge investable opportunity for brands and organizations. And people too. I think there's a big pendulum swing, right? Whereas I reckon we were getting to the point where sustainability was becoming increasingly important and then naturally COVID came and that was all we could talk about for two years and nothing else was on the agenda except for how are we going to continue to work, how are we going to save lives, how are we going to potentially get back to normal and now that we're sort of getting at that, a lot of what happened with COVID feels like it happened to us 
And now I think the important thing for all of us is that what can I individually do to make a difference? And a lot of companies now are leveraging AI technologies and automation to be more efficient, to be more sustainable in their approaches, but it also comes down to the individual. And that's a lot about what your podcast is about. And on my flight on the way up, which I bought carbon credits for, um, which is fantastic, but feels a little like pointless. Um, But uh, I was listening to you interview on your podcast, uh, Sarah Wilson, and she talked a lot about food wastage. Mm. And um, I do notice that you've just moved a uh, coffee cup, which is a physical coffee cup, and you removed my disposable which is, it, it's disposable and that it's non-recyclable coffee cup this morning. We don't call it disposable. We call it no. single-use. Single-use coffee. Plastics, right? Single-use mm. plastic, yes. Which a lot of people think those coffee cups are recyclable and they're not. Some are biodegradable and I'm going to put my army of worms in our worm farm on trying to making sure that your coffee cup is uh, it actually turned we get back a time into biomaterial. <laughs> can, we, <Yeah. laughs> can we get a time-lapse camera on it so I can feel guilty about getting up? Because I swore on the plane, I went, actually, this is one thing that I can do, very simple step that I can do to make a difference. And the first thing that I did this morning, I had one coffee in a normal cup and then I had to race to an Uber and I got it in a plastic cup. And I should have just said to the hotel, I'm going to bring this mug back in sometime this afternoon, trust me, and then just take the cup and run out the door. That would have been far better than taking this single-use cup on a journey to Avalon with me and and now have your worms try and take it apart. Yeah, but they're doing a good job and all all the worms are organic, I should say. So So what are we learning? What are you learning from your podcast? Your podcast now, your new podcast is about... Well, green tech. Yeah, I think so. I think this intersection of, of, of green and sustainability and technology, artificial intelligence, product stewardship, um, that intersection is really, really interesting. And so just to kind of concretize that with an example, I mean, we're sitting here in, the, here in the studio and you commented that, you know, both of us have, have the same iPhone case. So just for, for the audience here, we, are, we have nearly the same Pantone color. Oh. You know, of the you know, green tech. Um, so that's they, why I picked it too. Yeah, exactly. Nice, yep. nice. Yep. <laughs> so, I mean, the iPhone is a great example, right? Um, and I think I've shared this with you once, but there's a great, um, there's a great story uh, from Andrew McAfee at MIT, who talks about how technology is, in fact, in, enabling us to decouple us from planetary constraints and the iPhone's an example. So Apple's invested massively into the circular economy, which is through product stewardship, recycling. They've got Liam and Daisy, the the recycling robots. I think Daisy is built from parts of Liam, who was her predecessor. You know, they'll recycle 200 iPhones every hour. They'll, you know, split the components. And as a result, Apple is now one of the largest gold miners in the world because when we upgrade, we take the iPhone back to the store or we have it picked up by Apple. It goes back to a recycling station. They use the cobalt, the lithium, the gold in that iPhone to then make the next model. Wow. And if you compare and contrast that um, and we think about not just the circularity of that, but we also cast our minds back to the you know the early two thousands or the the nineteen nineties. You know, to a Radio Shack ad, we might imagine Christmas holiday, for example, and we think about the functionalities and the services that are actually in this device. So we're not using planetary virgin resources here anymore. These are recycled materials, but the services and functionalities of the iPhone will replace. 10, 20, 30 different devices that you might have thought about, mm. pieces of hardware that it would have all consumed, whether it's the, you know, the camcorder, the Sony Walkman, you know, the computer system, the DVD player, the, you know, the CD player, et cetera, et cetera, that we would have had in the 90s, none of which would have been from recycled materials. But, and we would have had, you know, kitted out our entire homes with all these disparate pieces of physical hardware all consuming virgin planetary resources. The functionalities, the services are now all on your iPhone. So we are decoupling ourselves from these planetary constraints. And I think that intersection of green and sustainability and clean tech is a really, really interesting and ripe space for um, innovation. You've just made me think badly about myself. 
just one more time as you think about the technology that's replaced the older technology. You know where I'm going with this when I showed you my record wall and all my vinyl records. I'm fairly sure making vinyl records is not good for the planet at all. But on the flip side... But you're, not, but you're not buying artwork as well, so there you uh, go. Oh, nice, so, thank, nice yeah, save. Because yeah, I did you. say I was using my vinyl <laughs> records as art, so I guess I am saving and it'll... Yeah. And I can rotate them. And so there's recycling of art at yeah. the same time. Hopefully an artist somewhere is not feeling left out, but you know, the artist who actually made those vinyl record designs are hopefully... Uh, very happy, yeah. very happy. So as technology progresses, like I, need, I didn't know that about the iPhone. I didn't know that the recycled parts... I mean, once upon a time I worked at HP and I knew that we were working at the time on um, many sustainable initiatives, but maybe the technology wasn't there or the, the corporate agenda wasn't there because the consumer didn't care as much as they do now. But that's really interesting that Apple is doing that given I don't think the average consumer knows that when they take a phone in that they're helping recycle and they're helping the planet. They just think I'm getting 200 bucks off my new iPhone. Yeah, and, and we're seeing more and more of that sense of product stewardship to the point where some leading brands like the B Corp Nimble that makes amazing um, you know, HDMI cables, uh, USB-C cables, all from recycled materials. So next time you buy some new cables for your tech gear, make sure you check out Nimble. But they actually provide in every uh, product a little um, recycled biodegradable non-plastic plastic bag for you to put all your old tech gear into prepaid envelope essentially through this bag and you send it back and nimble will make sure that they're actually taking accountability not just of their own stuff which doesn't actually need that much uh taken care of but other brands technologies to make sure that it gets properly recycled upcycled repurposed etc and I think that sense that, you know, you're not just cleaning up your own act, you're actually, in fact, also cleaning up the acts of other brands. You, you see this as well with you know, the likes of Microsoft and, and, and Google, etc. I mean, Microsoft is now aiming to offset all its carbon emissions back up until the point where Bill Gates founded the company. Wow. So it's not just looking at, okay, let's switch from today. Let's clean up our act going back to the, you know, the 1960s, the 1970s. Which we need to because the planet doesn't have infinite resources. What would you say to the person listening now that goes, what difference does it make if I do these small little steps, if we have large countries like India or China or whatever going to continue to emit carbon? What does Dave living down in Melbourne you know, recycling the odd thing and using solar panels and and maybe eventually getting an electric car, what difference will it make if I'm just this... small sand on a huge beach yeah so i think you're a parent just like me um i mean we think about this question when our kids go and say something about hey you know johnny down the road you know he doesn't need to go to bed at 7 30 or 7 o'clock or whatever it happens to be or you know johnny gets to eat lots of sugar or johnny you know johnny's still driving you know a, a diesel engine car for example and we don't then go, okay, well, just because Johnny's doing that, that's okay in our family and that's our, you know, value set as well. Uh, you know, the same applies, I think, in a global scale. Like, what are your values as, as an organization, as a, as, a, as a nation, as a family? And you've got to live in alignment with those values. I think that's the first way to kind of counter that. And just to say, you know, just because this is happening in, in, in India or in China or, you know, and, and there's a lot of cradle to cradle innovations on a massive scale in, in China, for example, right now. They're, while they're one of the biggest emitters, you know, not uh, per capita, but certainly in totality, they're also driving a lot of sustainable initiatives. And they're doing so because pollution has been so bad and people are waking up to that fact. So, I think that's a the, you know a key message that you know you got to live a values aligned life and run your business in a way that's truly sustainable because I also think that you know the only way to truly be sustainably profitable is to ensure that investors are going to keep backing you and that you're not a climate risk and secondly um, that consumers will punish you as well if your products and services are not seen as being sustainable and as achieving on environmental, social and governance metrics. 
So I think they're the ways to, to think about this. And we should all lead by example, right? You know, our own actions, you know, you have a voice that scales. I have a voice that scales. If we actually lead by example and invest in the right products and services, that also, you know, sends a message to the neighbors when they see those solar panels going up, for example. Yeah, it's such a good point. I was going back to like values and you immediately went to being a parent and like what's it going to mean and how do you raise your children? And I often think about that a lot as well. Did I tell a story? And you told the story around it. But it's also like, I mean, during lockdown, I got obsessed by Peloton and immediately in my head, I've got a quote on the wall, how you do anything is how you do everything. And so it's, it's having those values and it's the same whether you bring that to what you do in your work, when you're working every day, to how you become a parent, to what you do on the weekend. It's, it's being a value-driven individual that has morals and principles about how do you want to leave the earth? Are we going to leave it in a worse place than where we started it? And can each of us do something? At least you can feel proud, I guess, as an individual, my question that you've done something. My question was obviously leading because I do do things, but I was sort of leading you down the path of the average listener that might go, not even the average listener now because it's less than an average mm. that might just go, what do I care? I'm not going to do it. I mean, the single first thing we can do is stop using the recyclable, non-recyclable coffee cups. And the other one that came up that was huge was food wastage. That's massive. Mm. And just wastage in general of just all the different substances that we have. So I guess pay more attention to these things. And I also loved what you said about the city because I went into the city with my kids recently down in the Docklands in Melbourne. Mm. I haven't been there for five years. It was supposed to be amazing. And was it ghost town or not? It was borderline derelict. Like we parked the car right in the middle of the city, which is highly unusual. It's something that I did once in Detroit when that city was decimated and you paid a dollar to park your car in the middle of the city. There was a Quest Hotel that's completely shut down. There were shops that were half empty. And I immediately thought what you said earlier, which is when are the creatives coming back? Because this is an opportunity now for co-working spaces, for art galleries. And I actually walked past an art gallery and there was a friend's photography studio, pop-up photography studio in the Docklands. And she happens to live around the corner from me and I was super excited about it. Is that the regeneration of our cities? Because we're going to get through, we're going to go through a period now where not everyone's going into the city because we don't have to work there. So there's less population frequenting those cities. What do you think is going to happen with this? So I guess this is where the whole concept of the the second renaissance comes from. Um, Pandemics have had a history of being, you know, a real acid through society, but also a breath of fresh air at the same time. So whether it's the you know, Black Plague, which sadly decimated European cities like Florence, which became the cradle of the first Renaissance. 50% of the population lost their lives. As a result, labor became more scarce. Labor got paid more. As a result, you saw peasants becoming artisans, artisans becoming merchants, and merchants becoming new noblemen and women. And it became this huge social mobility quest for driving a new future and, and a new awareness of, of, of science, of humanism. We still live with social distancing ideas and the idea of quarantine, which comes from the Italian caranta, which is 40 days or caranta giorno, I think it is, which is 40 days at sea. So, and some of the health institutions that we still have to this day were in their embryonic stage as a result of that first, of that pandemic Um, we saw after the spanish flu again you know women getting involved in the workplace Uh, we saw the suffragette movement and we then of course through the 1920s had the roaring 20s and so these were all eras of creativity of rejuvenation we saw infrastructure changing so after the spanish flu well prior to the spanish flu i should say in most restaurants in most bars you'd always see next to the bar and we're sitting at a bar table here today you don't see a spittoon here Mm -hmm. but a spittoon was something that anytime you spent time around a bar or in a restaurant people would sit and spit and that was a cultural acceptable norm to be doing now people understood because of science during during the Spanish flu that that wasn't such a good thing you know aerosols and aerosolized you know germs etc 
And so things do change. I do think we're going to see that same change to the physical infrastructure, but also who's going to be living in cities, who's going to be investing in central business districts, et cetera. And they will be their creatives and they will be uh, just like Richard Florida calls it, you know, the, the creative class who'll be moving into those particular areas that might've been feeling a bit staid and old and, you know, maybe a blue sort of insurance company logo on most of those buildings. And I do think that they'll be rejuvenated and who knows, maybe they'll be filled with vertical farms and collaborative workspaces and your mates uh, pop up art galleries and yeah. photo galleries. Well, I, I, there's two things. So firstly, as I was driving in, um, the the banks that have closed most of their corner stores on every one of this prime real estate nearly in every suburb in Australia, most of the branches of the banks have closed and there's all this real estate now available. And so I think huge opportunities for creative spaces to go into those areas. But the second thing I wanted to do or ask you, how on earth do you know so much about history and so many of these stories? I'm sitting here nodding away going like, you're what? Spinning you're a futurist. In, but spinning <laughs> into a how? How what? Yeah, Quarantine in, qu yeah. Quarantining <laughs> in which boat? How yeah. did they, 40 days where? What fire? I'm like, how do you have time to go back and know all these stories? Some people say that futurists are like reverse historians, which is a bit of a you know mental trip. But um, my one of my majors at university was history and I've always had a... Have, fascination with history you actually paid attention i actually paid attention unlike some no i'm joking but um <laughs> yeah so history was one of my majors and and something i always loved and and something i guess i excelled in at school at, and at university so it's always been a passion and i think you know one of the things we learn from history is that we don't learn from history um so you know we always get to create a new future and i don't think that the future is just an extension of the past but i do think that sometimes even though history doesn't necessarily repeat itself constantly, there can be a rhyme sometimes, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. So, you know, and this is why in, in, you know, in current conflicts, be it, you know, Russia invading Ukraine, people are drawing analogies to, you know, the Second World War or what happens, you know, do you want to be a Neville Chamberlain or do you want to be a Winston Churchill when you stand up to dictators? Neville mm -hmm. Chamberlain was the one who was seen to appease Hitler at the time, Churchill stood up. How do we want to act? And so it's not that this conflict is the same, but there might be some things that rhyme and that give us some tools to think about, you know, as we grow wise I'm into thinking, the future. I'm thinking Neil Finn, history never repeats. And then Eddie Vedder, everything has changed. Absolutely nothing's changed, but it has. And there you go. And as how do we get to a more intelligent tomorrow? Well, I think there's a few ways, you know, certainly artificial intelligence, robotics, technology can help us do less of the menial and the mundane and do more of the meaningful and the humane. And what I mean by that is that, you know, whether it's as parents or as carers or as business people, as entrepreneurs, we spend a lot of our time doing menial shit, excuse my French, mm. and it actually takes away creative energy it makes us spend less time on innovation or thinking strategically about the future so i do think that we need the help of automation robotics ai to help us do less of excel spreadsheet punching for example or do less data entry things like that less bookkeeping right mm -hmm. that's one thing do less of the menial and the mundane do more of the meaningful and the humane that's how we grow more intelligent. I also think that the second piece comes from Daniel Kahneman's work who talks about fast and slow thinking and better decision making and how we tune more into mindfully our sort of longer range planning. And a good example of that is your own consumption of content. Now, coming back full circle to this idea that content is chemistry wrapped in story or narrative, what are we consuming? Are we clicking on clickbait? Are we checking out whether the slap by Will Smith was fake or real? You know, whether it was staged. Are we spending our... Well, it, he's a very good actor. So mm. my sense is it might have been fake. Mm. Um, I didn't click on that clickbait, of course. Yeah. Um, but, I, you know, are we spending our entire digital nutrition diet just consuming clickbait, which is this sort of fast thinking, which is, you know, 
It's like, you know... Um, Stealing our attention. It's certainly not, you know, low GI digital nutrition. It's something that's fast. It feels good. It's a sugar rush to the head. Scrolling through Instagram, same yeah. thing, right? Or are we engaging in deep and meaningful thinking? Are we consuming a podcast, listening to the final question about, you know, how do we make humans more intelligent? Or do we tune in after, you know, a minute or two? Yeah. And Kahneman says that as we switch from fast thinking to slow thinking, kind of from the, you know, the idea of the, the hare and the tortoise, that the smarter decisions are when we slow down, we meditate, we do yoga, we get in tune with ourselves. The Okinawans would call this their ikigai, which is the overlapping concentric circles of doing something that you're really passionate about, what you're good at, which can make you money, but also is good for the world. And I think when we do work that's aligned with our values and ourselves, but it's also good for the world, I think we all become a little bit smarter. That's and such more a good answer. Like I've got Jack Johnson soundtrack playing in my head now. Slow down, everyone. We're moving too fast. And I think when we do slow down and when we do really think about the outcome, what we're trying to achieve and why, and we go deep into content, we can learn, we can discover, we can consider, we can pivot, we can do all the things that we haven't done because we're just flicking and making rash gut decisions to everything. And I think that's something that individuals can do. I think that's important for how we're going to learn and reskill. And I think it's something that companies can do too as groups to take time out as that group to consider and to think and not just to rush. I think it's a really important statement to sort of finish mm -hmm. with because it's something that's like ai isn't about going faster it might actually be about finally slowing us down and giving us the ability to for humans as you talk about to start using your brain for better outcomes not just doing these mundane manual tasks yeah absolutely you're nodding in agreement because i'm recycling words that i know very well you feel very strong and passionate about thank you very much for having me in your studio to record this podcast yeah thank you for being on your podcast on our home turf it's a weird and wonderful world and i'm happy to be part of it thanks yeah. for having hey th i was gonna say thanks for having me see i immediately just went to thanks for having me anders thanks for being on the podcast yeah you can host your podcast here anytime all we'll good back. yeah <laughs> thanks mate thanks for being here and letting me be here at the same time yeah great to see you irl for more information about the Second Renaissance and our work on sustainable innovation, please visit my website, www.andersummernilsen.com. We would appreciate if you can take a moment to share the podcast with a friend or a colleague and help build the movement. We hope that what we learn together on the Second Renaissance can help us all build a sustainable future for ourselves and our children. See you in the near future.